Well, let's see what the mathematical model looks like for a Latin square. It's a very simple model. It's also an additive model like the previous ones we've had. Here are the observations are equal to the mean plus a rho contribution. Now that's the Greek letter rho, right? But I mean the rho classification in our example is the, are the various locations, right? So there'd be the rho classification. Gamma stands for the column classification. Those would be the furnaces in our case. Uh, the taus are the treatment class. That's what we're studying. That's the studied verb. We're trying to figure out what those blooming taus are, what the treatment effects are in spite of the variability due to locations and furnaces. And finally, we have the errors, which Mother Nature is always throwing on us to disturb things. These are the, and we're assuming these are random, normally and independently distributed. Okay, now that we have the mathematical model, we can go and look at the analysis of variance table. So let's scurry over. What I'm gonna do with the analysis of variance table at first is just look at the degree of freedom column. So let's come over here and see what the degrees of freedom look like for uh, this particular uh, Latin square. Now I'm starting the analysis of variance table out with the model, of course. Here's the model across the top, the same one we saw previously. And now here's the corrected sum of squares. Pray, how many degrees of freedom will the corrected sum of squares have? And you say, well, golly, there are nine observations, so there are eight degrees of freedom in the corrected sum of squares. We had to calculate the grand average to get that quantity. So we start out with eight degrees of freedom. Now there were two row classifications, there are two locations. And so how many degrees of freedom are there for rows? Two. And then there are two column, two degrees of freedom for columns and two degrees of freedom for treatments because there are three treatments and three columns. And so how many degrees of freedom would that leave over in the error sum of squares? And that would leave two degrees of freedom over in the error sum of squares. Alas. I'll tell you, gang, uh, you'd take the sum of squares for error and divide by its two degrees of freedom, you get a totally valid, perfectly all right estimate of the variance. But the trouble with it, it doesn't have very many degrees of freedom. It's a very weak, sort of wishy-washy, uh, you know, not very powerful estimate of the variance. Actually, when we try to run experimental designs, we'd like to get the variance reasonably well estimated. And to do that, we generally like to have something like, you know, well, seven or eight or nine degrees of freedom in that estimate of the variance. And so I would advise you against running a single three by three Latin square because there just aren't enough degrees of freedom left over in that estimate. And you think of all the assumptions you've made and all the slight violation that Mother Nature really does put into the system, uh, an estimate of variance based on two degrees of freedom is just, just too shallow, too weak. Well, what might we do in this case? Well, we could repeat the entire experiment, making in all, taking in all 18 observations. And I tell you, I just happen to have an experimental uh, three by three Latin square over here in which we just did that. We repeated the entire experimental design and got two observations in each one of the cells. And so once again, we have the three furnaces and we have the three locations and then we have the three treatments and the treatments are given by the letters. And you will notice that treatment A in furnace one location one gave me the two recorded observations of 71 and 61. What we do here, of course, the first thing we do after having completed this experimental design would be to get the average for A and the average for B and the average for C. Each one of those averages is based on six observations. And then we'd like to look at those averages in terms of the appropriate reference distribution. And to get, construct that reference distribution, we're gonna to have to estimate the variance. And how are we gonna get that estimate of the variance? Ha ha, we're gonna get that blooming estimate off the analysis of variance table. So let's scurry back and do that particular analysis of variance for those numbers that we saw here, we see here. R, well now, the corrected sum of squares in this case came out to be uh, 328. But pray, how many degrees of freedom does this uh, corrected sum of squares now have? That corrected sum of squares are 18 observations, so the corrected sum of squares is now going to have 17 degrees of freedom. All right, now we have to calculate the row sum of squares and the column sum of squares and the treatment sum of squares. How are we gonna go about that? Well, one way you get the row sum of squares is estimate the row effects and then take the squares of all those little row effects and that will give you the proper entry for the table. But, uh, you know, we all know a shortcut way of getting the row sum of squares and any of the other classification sums of squares for most ordinary analysis variance tables. Remember how we used to get the row sum of, uh, the block sum of squares and the treatment sum of squares and we had the uh, standard analysis of variance? What we would do in that case is take the now here's the equation uh, appropriate for getting block sum of squares. You take the block totals, square them, divide by the number of observations in each total, sum up those quantities, and subtract the correction factor. 
And if the number of observations is the same in each one of the block totals as it will be for our analysis in this case, you can use a shortcut formula. Take the sum of squares of the totals, divide by n, and subtract out the correction factor. Well, now, I've done that for the row, the column, and the treatment sum of squares. The row sum of squares, that example, turned out to be 33 and a third. Uh, the column sum of squares of the location, the furnace location sum of squares turned out to be 30 and a third. Uh, the treatment sum of squares turns out to be 84. And when I subtract these sources of variation away from the total, of variable, uh, total available variability, I end up with an error sum of squares of 180 and a third. And how many degrees of freedom does that error sum of squares now have? Well, 17 minus 6 would be 11. So that's an error sum of squares, 11 degrees of freedom. And now I can quickly go ahead and estimate my variance. My estimate of the variance is now equal to uh, 16.394. Uh, that's an estimate of sigma squared, the intrinsic variability. You know, enter stage left, somebody claiming there are no differences between those treatment effects. The treatment effects are all zero. You say, well, okay, if the treatment effects are all zero, then what I've done is I've partitioned the sum of squares into two components, one with two degrees of freedom, one with 11. And so this 84, this sum of squares, 84 over here, divided by its degrees of freedom, would provide another estimate of the variance. And so I'd have a 42, would also estimate sigma squared. But of course, that's given, right, that sigma, that the tau's are all equal to zero. And now we're back in a rather familiar situation, aren't we? We have two numbers both parading around claiming to estimate sigma squared. And what's the probability of this occurrence? That's determined by computing the F ratio. So I have an F with 2 and 11 degrees of freedom. 2 in the numerator estimate of the variance and 11 in the denominator estimate of the variance. Comes out equal to 2.56. Pray, what's the critical value of F with 2 and 11? The critical value of F is 3.98. Now, Rare event Fs would be larger than that, be out on the tail of the curve. And my estimate of the, my uh, observed F statistic is inside, not in the critical region. And so what must I conclude on the base of this test? I must conclude that there is not enough evidence for me really to reject the hypothesis there are no effects among the treatments. Golly Pete, right? After taking, you know, spending all that time getting the furnaces balanced out and locations balanced out and all the rest of it, I still can't detect any real differences between those treatments. At least the data will not contradict the hypothesis and nothing is going on among those treatments. Well now, that is disappointing. R, and I, just about this time, the guy that ran the experiment was going to say, hey, Stu, I didn't tell you, but uh, you know, we took two observations in each one of those cells. And I'll tell you what I did when I replicated the design. I ran the first nine, the first design, I ran the whole design on Monday, and then I did the whole thing again on Tuesday. You did, you know, that's great, you see? That's another source of variability. There's a day-to-day -day source of variability. In this case, it's balanced out across the entire experiment. All the treatments are done on each day. Each furnace was used each day. Each location was used each day. That's great. So I really have another source of variability I could take out of the experiment. We call this the replicate sum of squares. The design has been repeated. So let's just take a quick look at our observations and see uh, what's going on. And by golly, the top observation